there a way out? Can I change my brain? Am I just a victim to who I am? I'm your host, Steve Sisler. Stay tuned for another episode of Behavioral Insights. Welcome to episode 39 uh, on the Behavioral Insights Podcast. I'm your host, Steve Sisler. Today we're going to be talking about marriage and behavioral difference. Coming up next on Behavioral Insights. Folks, thanks for joining me once again uh, for this Behavioral Insights podcast. Uh, it's an early morning for me. It's about 5.44 in the morning. Um, it's nice and chilly and quiet the way I like it. Um, we're going to talk about marriage and behavioral difference today. I guess the last podcast kind of sparked this in me. Um when I was talking about uh, the nine uh, uh, elements, uh, 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 guide, guard, govern, direct, correct, protect, cherish, nourish, admonish, got me thinking about this. So um, let's talk a little bit about relationships, behavioral differences, and how this typically works. Um, So as a rule, um, opposites in behavior attract, uh, but the similarities within the value set tend to create endurance in the relationships. So similarities endure, opposites attract. Uh, so the attraction is in what they see, which is the behavioral components. We know, we know them as observable indicators. Um, and then beliefs um, ideals, uh, where religion and politics are set. That's the value base. When you have similarities there, endurance can be created through that piece. Um, and is it possible to have both? Absolutely. Uh, a difference in behavior combined with shared values tends to create a situation where the odds end up better that people are going to uh, stick together. Um, it's when the values don't align, uh, particularly when the differences are glaring, that drawbacks really become apparent. So one of the best people in the world to understand behavioral differences is John Gottman. Um, he's a professor uh, in psychology and known for his work on marital stability and relationship analysis. Uh, through direct scientific observations. Um, so he's got, he's probably the only person out there with actual data on this. Um, very powerful stuff. Um, uh, 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 he really understands behavioral differences within a partnership agreement. Um, He wrote the book entitled The Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work. Um, So if you're interested in that kind of a thing, you would want to get that book for sure. Um, And so uh, he talks about uh, the love lab that he created um, uh, where he's at. I can't remember the university he's at at the moment, but he created this love lab where they've studied couples and recorded uh, and monitored the couple's physiology, their audio, voice tracks, facial expressions, mannerisms. So not only were they being recorded, they were on video. 
And the couples in these situations would actually argue about money. Uh, and these are real arguments. I mean, these were uh, situations where they're in this love lab to the point of where you kind of forget the cameras are around and you're just dealing with life and different situations. So they would get them on these topics and then they would watch them argue, to be honest. Um, and through this psychoanalytical and behavioral exercise, <laughs> he devised a way to basically watch a couple argue for probably under 10 minutes and he could predict their divorce to the tune of 91%, um, which is outrageously incredible. Um, so these predictions are based on proven empirical studies through the many years he's had this love lab um, going on. Um, so anyway, um, uh, uh, one of the things he's under, you know, he's discovered um, is that uh, couples therapy uh, will not work long term uh, because the incest, the uh, essential ingredients are not tapped into. So he calls this these marriages that work. He calls them emotionally intelligent marriages. Uh, and so emotional intelligent marriages contain this one dynamic. Uh, and the dynamic is, uh, when negative thoughts and feelings in the people are kept from overwhelming the positive ones. Um, uh, and so, uh, you know, he calls this positive sentiment override. Um, uh, and so uh, it's real interesting to read his um, uh, work. Um, so I want to give you some of the statistics that he's gathered over the many years him and his colleagues have conducted these couple studies in their university love lab. So number one, over a 40 year period, here we go. 67% of second marriages uh, break up. 67% of marriage number two um, end. Um, half of all first divorces occur within the first seven years. So it really doesn't take long to figure out this isn't working. Uh, people who stay married live four years longer than those who don't. So that's interesting. Um, here's another uh, thing they realized. Bad and dysfunctional marriages lead to psychological stresses and consequences, including high blood pressure, heart disease, anxiety, depression, suicide, violence, homicide, psychosis, and substance abuse. Um, they have discovered that the immune system becomes depressed within divorcees. Um, heightened marital stress has a direct effect on children and the children's behavior. Uh, now here's something interesting, and I was just talking to somebody about this. Um, Peaceful divorces have a far better effect on children than bitter marriages. Um, so that's interesting. Um, that's probably common sense when you think about that. Um, why are these stats so disturbing? Uh, that would be my question. You know, uh, I think it's because we have not figured out you know, what's wrong in our relationships. Like people have not figured out what, what's wrong. Um, most people don't understand the behavioral differences in people. And here's the big one. People believe they can change a person. Okay. That is the biggest myth. It's the biggest lie, um, ever. Now I've been working with a guy, um, 
he's got a marriage situation going on here. I forget how long he's been married. It's his second marriage. It's not working. It's not going to work. Um, but both believe they can have some kind of a magical effect on the other person and the person's going to change. If you are in a relationship and you don't like the person you're in the relationship with, meaning you don't like the way they behave, the way they do things, um, you're screwed. Um, uh, and, and that sounds harsh, but um, the way relationships work is you have to accept each other as is before you commit in a marriage. Um, if you think for one minute you're going to commit to a relationship maritally, in other words, you're, you're entering into a contract with this person, and that at some point in the future, they're going to become a different person, somebody more or less, you know, geared towards what you're after, and you're going to have something to do with that change, you're on crack. Um, that is not going to happen. Uh, if you can't accept somebody as is, you have no business marrying that person. Now, this is not including secret behavior that you don't know anything about. Um, and there's nothing you can do about that. In other words, people cannot, how do I want to word this? Um, people will only let you know about them what they want you to know about them. And if you don't know it, you don't know it. And there's, that, that's really no fault to you. There are people out there that keep big secrets. Um, and it's just the way it is. So in that regard, marriage is rolling dice. Um, okay. Uh, you could have all these external signs, you know, all these signs pointing to everything seems to be okay here and getting along well, all the, all the good ingredients seem to be there. And then you're two, three, four years in and, who on earth is this person? Um, that happens and it's sad when it does, but there's nothing you can do about that. Um, it's just humans. It's what they do. Um, not all of them, uh, but there's plenty of them out there doing that. They just don't reveal the cards. And there are certain people that are more like that than others. Um, they're really good at lying. Um, and that doesn't mean they're a, quote, liar. It means they're really, really good. They're experts at not allowing their emotions to show up on their face. So you are in the dark. Um, and hopefully that didn't happen to you. Um so couples don't understand the brain, they misinterpret each other's actions, uh, and they obviously can't control the way they feel. So because Gottman's followed up with his research couples in the long term, he's discovered that uh, when people are working on communication and conflict resolution strategies, they never lead to a happier marriage. Now, most of your counseling um, in marriage counseling, I'm talking about, uh, there's always a heavy, uh, reliance on communication and conflict resolution, communication strategies and things like this. Um, uh, uh, it, it don't work. <laughs> it doesn't work. Um, uh, hello. <laughs> uh, I never talk about those things. Uh, that, that stuff doesn't work. Everybody thinks it does and it doesn't. Um, uh, and it's crazy. Uh, uh, now I used to do that many, many years ago. I mean, I was counseling couples in my twenties. Um, so, uh, I was married at age 21, 
was counseling people by age 23, uh, people old enough to be my parents um, at times. Um, but um, anyway, uh, 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 conflict resolution uh, is just not proven to be the pivotal factor uh, as happily married couples had shared uh, 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 their own fair share of conflict. Um, so what Gottman discovered is this, it's the positive sentiments overriding the negative sentiments coming from each partner that creates, you know, uh, this marital stability, uh, or the long term ability. Um, so, uh, although behavior can be complex, it's definitely predictable. And if you've heard this podcast, for any length of time, you know this is true. Uh, uh, behavior and attitudes is a science. And once you know what's going on, you can predict what's likely going to happen. Um, so there are many behavior types getting together these days, but there are two styles that mostly get together. And those are the ones I'm going to use in my examples today. Um, uh, and so you can decide where you are in all this, but the the two people I'm, I, I'm going to talk about, the two types um, that tend to get together more than any other type are what I call the Jordan River and the Dead Sea. Um, I use these bodies of water as a metaphor so you can remember them. Um, so the Jordan River always marries the Dead Sea. So when I'm profiling a Jordan River, I already know the odds of them being being married to the Dead Sea are really high. <laughs> so I start talking about the partner and they're like, how the hell do you know about my partner? And I say, well, the odds are in your favor that that's who you picked um, or that's who you were attracted to. Um, uh, and so uh, uh, these two bodies of water have very strong, strict differences. And like people, they're very identifiable and reliable. Uh, so let's talk about the Jordan River. Uh, this is your typical visionary. These are the active emotions, um, anger and optimism, uh, forward emotions, future thinkers. Um, uh, so they think forward uh, as a rule, which means most of the time. So a forward thinker tends to act quickly uh, they think quickly. Uh, they're more reactive as opposed to proactive. Uh, they're able to switch lanes really fast. They're able to switch gears very fast. Uh, uh, and they're more concerned about where they're going, which is future, than they are about where they are, which is present. Um, and they typically don't pay attention well. Um, it's for this reason that Others may feel like they're always trying to catch up with these folks um, uh, emotionally. Uh, so it's an active style that thinks and acts very quickly and oftentimes has attention deficit. Uh, uh, they can be very decisive or spontaneous or both. Uh, very quick decision makers. They change their minds often. Um, hey, I want to do this. And then 10 minutes later, hey, let's do this instead. Um, that kind of thinking. So these are visceral brain intuitionists. <laughs> um, they're limbic driven, in other words. They operate out of an instinction in the brain. Um, uh, so uh, sometimes I call these people wolves uh, because they can attack, they manipulate, they emulate, they exaggerate, they dictate, they eradicate, they formulate, they irritate. <laughs> All the eights. Um, uh, so visceral thinkers really live out of a wide emotional spectrum. They're very emotional and they can also be very logical. Uh, uh, so they can be either or both. Um, uh, uh, they have mood swings and behavioral swings that can come out of nowhere. Um, they have short fuses. Uh, they're verbally aggressive, they're talkers, they're conversationalists. They can be friendly, outgoing, direct, spontaneous, quick, fun, uh, uh, mindless at times, and very impulsive. In other words, they have no patience. 
Um, they need to move around a lot, uh, doing something, interacting with someone. They get bored easy. Um, uh, so uh, the combination creates a person who must be doing something with someone most of the time. They don't like downtime unless they're recuperating. Uh, and they don't really like being alone. Uh, if they run a business, they uh, will seek praise and strokes at work. But then when they come home, the partner knows their best and worst self. So they don't get the praise at home. So they don't like to come home sometimes. Um, because coming home is facing the facts and uh, being at work is living the dream. Um, it's, it's better. And, uh, and the people that don't live with them think they're amazing. Uh, but their partner will say, yeah, well, you don't live with this person. <laughs> um, that, that's, that happens a lot. Uh, and so, uh, these styles are also non-compliant usually. Um, they, are uh, they try to, mar they like to march to the beat of their own drum, uh, they live on their own terms. They live by their own instructions. Uh, they can be exciting, fun. They can be challenging and very charming. So if I'm thinking of disc patterns that might reflect a Jordan River type, um, uh, consistent dominant influencing, uh, consistent pure influencing, in other words, the only emotion in play is the influencing motion, the I and the disc, or the D for the dominance, and the I is the influence, so the DI types, the I types, the D solid types, the core D types, the extreme DI types, so super high uh, overextended dominant influencing, IS types, so moderate S, anywhere between uh, 50 and 60, but the rest is uh, influence. Uh, uh, but mostly, um, dominance and influencing solo types or together in varying degrees of consistency. Um, these styles can be emotionally needy at times, um, uh, but only if they're more limbic than logic driven. So the logic is found in the anger emotion and the limbic is found in the optimistic emotion. Um, they also like words of affirmation, meaningful touch. So the love languages, um, those are the ones that tend to work with these folks. They like praise and strokes. Um, uh, they like to converse. Uh, they like to be spontaneous. They can be pointed. They live in a fishbowl. So you know exactly what they're feeling. And when they're feeling it, they walk in the room. You're like, oh my God, what's wrong now? Because it'll be all over their face. Uh, they tend to put their cards face up on the table. Uh, they expose themselves um, and usually not feeling, without feeling uncomfortable. They just, they just say it. Um, uh, and this is the cards face up type. Um, they don't mask their emotions. They just spill it all out on the table. Uh, they like to get to the bottom of issues quickly. Um, they expose their emotions without holding back and will want uh, prompt responses. So uh, this is just how they operate. They don't store up a record of wrongs done to them because they usually don't deal with offenses uh, over a long term. They deal with them right away. Uh, and so they have what we call the empty closet. They do not store issues in a closet. They throw them right out on the table as soon as they happen. So imagine saying something to one of these types and rather than just looking at you and thinking to themselves i can't believe they just said that they just look at you and say what did you just say like that they just deal with things right away so they don't hold grudges at all uh they forgive and forget and usually because they forgot um they are efficient and energized and they act on impulse in other words they don't think um, they're flexible, uh, and they can be careless, which means they do things with less care. Uh, they hate to wait. Um, they're always independent of people instead of relying on people. 
when they're ready to go, they just go. Uh, so there's a lot we could say about this style, but um, I think you get the picture. Um, now let's look at the Dead Sea, which is the total opposite of this style. Uh, this is a contrarian when it comes to the Jordan River. Um, so for starters, the Dead Sea is very inflexible. I like to say the Jordan River is made of rubber and the Dead Sea is made of glass. Um, uh, uh, so real important to understand that. Um, rather than being open and revealing, the Dead Sea is guarded and secretive. Uh, this doesn't mean they're deceptive. It means they're protective, totally different. Uh, they just don't show the cards. Uh, they, hard, they hold their cards very close to their chest, face down in their lap. Um, they may not even know the cards they hold. Now, this happens a lot if they have overextended emotions in this area. Um, uh, it's very important to understand that. They tend to be listeners, so they're attracted to communicators. So they get to listen, and then their partner gets to talk. Um, they're stabilizers, so they bring stability um, to the relationship, whereas the Jordan River is unstable. So they like the stability. Um, so stabilizers are usually attracted to destabilizers. Uh, so stabilizers sit down when they get into the canoe. Destabilizers don't. They walk around in the canoe. So when you've got the Jordan River walking around in the canoe, uh, the Dead Sea is holding on for dear life. Uh, they can't do anything because they're too busy trying to keep the boat from tipping over. And that's the emotional difference between the two. Um, stabilizers are long-termers uh, and typically loyal. Now, when I say loyal, I'm not speaking of virtuous loyalty, where I'm devoted loyal to you. They're lo they appear loyal because they don't like change. So they settle in and put down roots deep. So they're a mile deep, but they're an inch wide. Um, the destabilizing types, the Jordan River types, are a mile wide and an inch deep. Um, so that's the difference there. Uh, stabilizers or the Dead Sea, they tend to be homebodies, very family oriented. They're very methodical, careful, purposeful, dependable, cautious, and like to follow through and finish things. And they need closure uh, on everything. Uh, so the biggest difference between the Jordan River and the Dead Sea is safety and security uh, needs. The Dead Sea needs safety measures and security measures in place. Uh, so uh, the, the Dead Sea never feels safe and never feels secure. Uh, but for some unknown reason, they are attracted to the most unsafe people types. Now, why is this? Usually, uh, it's because the unsafe part uh, 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 is uh, uh, part and parcel with another attribute, which is the security piece. So the stabilizer knows the destabilizer will kill the intruder that breaks into the house and this is what makes them feel safe. So um, uh, their safety isn't pointed to that partner, it's pointed to what that partner will do on their behalf. 
um, it's like having a guard dog, um, uh, but you're afraid to feed it. Um, it's like that. Um, uh, but in the end game, I'd rather feel safe uh, than sorry. Um, so what I'm giving you are just the um, uh, uh, the rules here. There's a lot of variables going on that I'm not even bringing up here, um, but th those are the rules. So these are the two types, and I'd say between uh, 55 and 68 percent of visionaries will marry uh, the Dead Sea, um, and it doesn't matter uh, which one is male and which one is female. Um, uh, it, it, it can still happen. So the active type is the, excuse me, Jordan River. The passive type is the Dead Sea. So Dead Sea types, uh, pure S in the disc, um, meaning that's the only emotion in play, patience. Um, S, C, I, those three, uh, consistent and in play, uh, and all with very low dominance, by the way. So below 30, um, uh, I, S, uh, very high. Um, so this is an overlap. So I, S, very high. You have two pieces playing here, which are, spontaneity in the I, the influence, and security in the S, um, in the patience. Uh, so these are very relatable, but they tend to have the most vices. Um, and you, you don't know they have the vice because everything appears wonderful in the optimism, but the patience is holding the cards very close. So although they're showing you their ace and their king, um, you don't see the two and the three um, uh, until it's too late. Um, so uh, the SC types, so just very uh, strong or consistent patience fear emotions with very low optimism and, and dominance anger. Um, and then pure fear. Pure C, uh, pure conscientious types um, with low dominance. Um, and we'll put the patients on the line. So we'll put that right at the energy line here for this type. Uh, we're going to put patients at about a 50 to a 52 um, for that. So together, the two styles will always uh, experience some behavioral challenges. Uh, now, this certainly doesn't mean, you know, the relationship isn't going to work. But what it does demonstrate uh, is strong differences in how they see the world around them and act and interact with each other in this relationship. So the destabilizer is active while the stabilizer is passive. Um, hey, let's go do this. And then the, de the uh, stabilizer, ah, I don't want to leave home. Can we just eat here? Uh, uh, so active types, and I've said this before, they kick in the front door with a shotgun while the passive types slip around the back window with a jackknife. Um, so here's a uh, example of a conversation between an active and a passive. Um, so I'll start with the active. What's wrong? You, you seem extra quiet. Is everything all right? Here's the passive. Uh, I'm fine. Uh, you don't look fine. You're acting weird. It's not even like you. That's the active. Here's the passive. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm fine. Okay. They're lying. Um, uh, I, I, just need, I just need some space. Um, okay. Active. What are you talking about? Space for what? Passive. Can we talk about this later? Active, why can't we talk about it now? Is it something I said? Passive, I don't want to talk about it right now. 
Here comes the active short fuse. I hate it when you do this. And then they storm off, lacking the patience to have this ridiculous conversation that doesn't seem to be going anywhere. Um, this is what can happen. Um, uh, the, 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 the active person is trying to pry the cards out of the hand of the passive and they won't give them up. Um, this is a normal exchange for these types. Um, uh, uh, the active wants to get to the bottom of what's going on with the partner, uh, cards face up, while the passive isn't ready to deal with it yet, cards face down. Uh, the reasons for needing more time to negotiate their emotions are likely going to be associated with safety and security. Uh, so what might that be? It's not safe to say what it is that it's bothering me because it might not go over well. Uh, it's not safe to say what it is because I don't want to hurt their feelings. Uh, it's not safe to say uh, what's going on because I'm not sure what kind of reaction I'm going to get. It's not safe to say anything because I said I was over it last week, but I'm actually not over it. And I'm afraid to say that I'm still not over it. Uh, um, it's not safe to say because... What if my partner is all done with me because I screwed up again? Uh, uh, I'm afraid that what I did makes me a bad person. All these thoughts can flood, uh, and we call this flooding, by the way. Uh, all these thoughts can flood the mind of a passive type. Uh, uh, so we'll just say that the passive person in this particular scenario is the female. Uh, uh, so what happened in this story? Well, let's just say uh, the wife overdrew her checking account. Um, how often did this happen? <laughs> let's say it's happened twice in three years. Uh, but a small incident becomes monumental in the mind of a stabilizer uh, and can create illusions of abandonment or feelings of inferiority or being a bad person. Now, depending upon how patient the person is, if their anger is extremely out of play, so below 30, 20, 10, down there, um, and the fear and or the uh, patience is 80 or plus, um, then uh, this can be a real problem. Um, and so that brain type is always waiting for the left shoe to drop. Um, and so in the relationship, uh, that's what can be happening. Um, if I say this, then it's all over. Um, so it's extremely daunting. Um, so the passive wife in this situation may fear rejection, looking stupid, abandonment, and all these different feelings can, can flood in. Uh, it can also be a sign of shame-based emotions. So shame and guilt are very different. Guilt says I did something wrong uh, or I did something bad or I made a poor decision, whereas shame says I'm a bad person. So the difference between I am and I did can be the difference between emotional success and emotional failure. And uh, some really, really big problems can come out of this. Um, uh, so what could the conversation have gone like if they were both very emotionally healthy? Um, let's start this over again. So the active person, what's wrong? Passive person. I'm feeling bad because I overdrew my check-in account last week. Active person, still? Passive person, it's only happened twice in the last three years. Active person, how much did they charge you again? I thought you were over that. Passive person, no, nah, it costs 32 bucks. Uh, I feel so stupid. Active person, you are stupid. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, uh, we spent that last week on coffee. Uh, who cares? We'll be fine. Passive person, I know, I'll get over it, but thanks for understanding. Yeah, okay, great, move on. That's healthier. Uh, but just playing cat and mouse, like, I don't know, there's nothing wrong, like, that happens so often, and what happens is um, there's a lack of trust. Um, so we're already on the wrong foot here. Um, uh, there's a fear of the unknown. Uh, 
um, all these different things. Um, and so uh, when people are uninhibited and open with each other, uh, things go much better. Uh, uh, but when our behaviors are left unchecked, we will just fall into these usual patterns because it's behavioral wiring. It's just how we're wired. Uh, uh, so the communication styles, you know, are very different. Um, so notice that the active person wanted to get to the bottom of it and the passive person didn't want them to know what was going on. Why? Because it's not safe. Um, and, uh, 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 you know, you can see how this can become a problem. Uh, now in the second conversation, the emotions were the same. Uh, what differentiates the former conversation from the latter conversation is deep friendship. Um, so the, 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 the security piece really changes through deep friendship and deep friendship is always the foundation underneath lasting relationships. Now Gottman points this out that many years of behaviorally assessing and watching couples in the love lab, he found that deep friendship is the linchpin within successful relationships. Uh, because when the romance wears off, all you have is friendship left. If you don't have friendship, you don't have anything. Uh, now, if you've been married as long as I've been married, uh, and I've been married 36 years, uh, romantic engagement, that ebbs and flows. It comes and goes based upon all kinds of different factors. But friendship remains stable. It remains uh, the, the lifetime of that relationship. If you've got a, a deep, be, deep, uh, strong friendship. Uh, so trust is not born out of romance. Trust is born out of friendship. Um, and so it's, it's, it's something you need to understand. So let's talk a little bit about uh, this positive sentiment override. Uh, uh, knowing each other well uh, and still appreciating and understanding the differences between you and your partner uh, uh, really this 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 kind of a relationship uh, works when there's deeper friendship uh, in your in shared existence. Um, so the main uh, effective vectors here are the positive or the negative sentiment overrides. And this is what Gottman points out. Uh, so according to his research, those who have a positive sentiment override live better when negative occurrences take place in the relationship uh, because the relationship is balanced towards the positive. So those in relational negative sentiment override are those relationships who are balanced towards the negative in the relationship. And they become more reactive rather than responsive during times of difficulty and you will always have times of difficulty. Um, the three things that there's going to be problems in a marriage are going to be communication, sex, and money. Um, uh, and the money is the first one. Uh, it's the biggest one. Uh, most problems are centered around money. Um, uh, communication and sex are, you know, they're neck and neck for second place. Uh, but communication, sex, and money tend to be the big three. Um, so, uh, issues that arise within any relationship become interpreted with the color of the positive or the negative vector, uh, of the sentiment override. Uh, so what is positive sentiment override? Things are seen with a positive light, um, and negative sentiment override, things are always seen in an increasingly negative light. Um, so here's an example. Let's say, uh, you're both trying to get out the door to go to the movies. Um, 
and your partner is late uh, getting out, let's say uh, your partner knows that you enjoy the movie previews. I know I love the movie previews, sometimes better than movies. <laughs> I love watching what's coming up because I'm a future thinker. Uh, so, and I'm, I guess I'm pulling this out of my own life here. Uh, my wife's a stabilizer and I'm, uh, my wife's the Dead Sea. I'm a Jordan River. Um, she's becoming more Jordan River though. And I'm becoming more Dead Sea after 36 years. It's crazy how this is changing. Um, uh, that's a whole nother story. Um, uh, but I'm a preview person. I have been my whole life. Um, she doesn't care about that. Uh, so trying to get out to go to the movies, she needs closure. I don't. Um, so things have to be buttoned up before she can leave. And that could mean anything. So if you have small children, you know, uh, they have to make sure the kids are situated with dinner and bedtimes, um, all this kind of stuff before they can leave. They know where everything's at, uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, uh, so if your partner knows that you enjoy the previews, but because they're not ready when you were, what happens? Well, the the, the Jordan River gets overwhelmed with feelings of disrespect, non-appreciation. You don't appreciate the fact that I like seeing the preview, so you don't care about me, which translates into you don't like me, blah, 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 blah. Uh, so this starts to go negative real fast. Um, so rather than just thinking in terms of maybe your partner, maybe my wife is uh, just trying to gussy up, and look nice for me um, for the night. Uh, and maybe she just wanted to make sure the kids were going to be safe. Maybe, you know, and, and so let's say I'm translating this into you don't like me. And she's trying to translate it into I'm trying to look good for you. <laughs> so talk about missing it here. Talk about missing the boat. Um, so if you're too negative, then you start acting like a weirdo. Um, uh, and so going to the movies, you start giving off the silent treatment. Um, you're just acting weird. What's the matter? Nothing. You're starting to pout like a baby. Um, all because uh, she didn't stroke your ego. Uh, all because you thought she doesn't care about you in the stupid previews. Um, this happens because it's happened to me. Uh, I don't do this now, um, but you know, when I was young, these are the kinds of things that would happen. But because we had more positive than negative um, sentiment override, um, it didn't ruin things. Um, so uh, problems and challenges in relationships are always sparked by emotional needs going unnoticed and unmet. Uh, now, here's where here's where things get weird. Rather than focusing on the emotional needs, people tend to focus on the problems unmet emotional needs create. So why are you acting weird versus what was the need and why didn't I meet it? Um, and so this isn't just in relationships as partnerships or in marriage. This could be parent children. Um, the kids are acting weird or the kid is acting weird or the mom is acting weird. Usually it's because an emotional need wasn't met and you just don't have the wherewithal to say it because you feel dumb um, uh, or you, you don't want to believe it and your brain bias is getting in your way. Uh, so because your need for affirmation is greater than your ability to use your rational mind, uh, uh, VBR, we call this visceral brain reactive, uh, you misinterpret your partner's tardiness and made it all about you and not all about them. Uh, so this negative sentiment override could derail the entire evening if you're not careful. Uh, observations quickly become accusations when negative sentiment override is in play. Now, um, what happens when this all goes to hell um, and you've got a situation on your hands? Um, what Gottman has discovered as there are couples that have a strong uh, 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 
record of what are known as repair attempts. Um, so, for example, with positive sentiment override, there are behavioral attempts to repair tension. Um, and this is known as repair attempts. So couples will attempt to repair the tear in the emotional fabric once they realize they've hurt the partner. Um, so this can be realized because body language, um, you, you know, going, going to the dark side of the moon, they go quiet, um, they look sad, they look down, maybe they cry, uh, all these different things. So what do repair attempts look like? Um, so think about if you're listening to this and you have a partner, think about you just have a spat of some kind, you know, some situation where you're just upset with each other and it went sideways. Um, now what? Now, a lot of people, it just over time just wears off and then they just act like nothing happened. But that's not, it doesn't ever wear off. It just creates a layer of shellac. Um, so unless it's repaired, it's not repaired. I want you to listen to me here. If you don't repair it, it's not repaired. You just think it is. Um, it's never repaired unless you actively repair it. So every problem needs a repair. You just don't ignore it. Um, so uh, my wife has... Uh, her own set of repair tools, uh, and I've got mine. Um, and so um, it's just this face that she makes. Um, and then she'll like look down with this face. It looks like kind of like a sad lizard. Um, and then she does her head a certain way and she looks down and when I look, I follow her gaze down to the floor. I look at her feet and they're just turned in, you know, like this little child. And it's pretty funny. Um, and then she looks back up at me with this face and it, oh, <laughs> I'm picturing it right now and it works like every single time. Um, uh, and so, and then I've got my own repair attempts. Like if something's happened and it's been 10 minutes, 15 minutes, uh, you know, you're feeling you can cut the air with a knife. Um, and it's like, oh, all right, I got to fix this. Um, uh, I broke the vase. I have to put it back together. So I might do something like just look at her. I'll just like walk by her in the kitchen and I'll go, why don't you just shut up about it? with uh, this kind of a voice. Why don't you just shut up about it? Like that. And then she just looks at me with the lizard face and goes, no, you shut up. Uh, and then we just hug. Um, and then it's really easy at that point to say, sorry, if you're the instigator um, and or whatever. Um, and we've been doing that for 30 some odd years. Um, I typically... I could probably count on two hands in 30 some odd years where something's gone overnight into the next day. Um, on two hands in 30 years, 36 years. Um, just doesn't happen. Um, uh, I don't know why, all right? I, I don't want, there's no virtue in it. It just hasn't happened. Um, I, don't, we're, I don't know if we're lucky uh, we've had other issues, um, uh, and it doesn't mean we're problem free. It means we fix problems. Um, nobody, nobody, nobody is problem free. It's, do you fix the problems? That's the difference. Um, so, um, uh, some marriages start with what's known as a high positive set point. Uh, but they can't maintain it. Um, and so it might start off well, but it never finishes well. Uh, uh, in this case, res the resentment that can accompany the failure to maintain anything within the relationship 
and will always initiate a negative sentiment override. Um, so keeping the positive sentiment override in your marriage can be done through, you know, certain uh, things. Uh, uh, so, you know, I don't want to get all into all of this, uh, but you got to get Gottman's book, The Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work. And it's got a lot of really good information and statistics in it uh, that could help you. Um, so, um, uh, so what you need to understand is that happy, happily married couples do not have less conflict than unhappy couples. They're simply better at repairing the conflicts before they get out of hand or before negative sentiment override, uh, takes place and overrides the positive sentiments. In the strongest marriages, uh, uh, Gottman says the partners have a quote, common sense of meaning. This means they support each other's aspirations and they understand that they are loved despite the behavioral differences. Um, so most marital arguments can't be resolved and it's normal that this happens. Um, uh, Many couples try to change each other's minds, but with futility, you, you can't do it. One can only change their own mind. Now, you got to realize that you can only change your own mind. You will never change somebody's mind. And if you think you did, you didn't. They did. You didn't do it. They did it. If you think you did it, you're wrong. Um, and if you get that thinking that you can change people's minds, you know, you got to get that out of your head because it's going to be your downfall. You cannot change another person's mind. You can influence a person, but they are the ones that change their mind. You didn't do it. Um, uh, people are different and you have to learn to live happily with the differences and not view those differences as intentional jabs. Uh, so remember, the strongest marriages are not built on romance. They're built on deep friendship. Um, and so, uh, relationships where you have a strong active type and a strong passive type will find opportunities every single day to screw this whole thing up, like royally. Um, and so it's important that you understand that you're going to have differences. You're going to have problems. There are two different brains at work here with two different sets of DNA, with two different upbringings, with two different formative years, with two different school teachers growing up, living in two different neighborhoods, with two different sets of friends, and all these influences have an impact on how you view the world, how you think, and all these different things. And it takes a lifetime to figure out uh, one one hundredth of a partner. It takes a lifetime to figure out one one hundredth of a partner. Um, and that being said, you're only figuring out what they make available to you to figure out. The rest of it, you will never know what's going on. You'll never know what it is. Um, and so... Uh, uh, now, marriage isn't for everyone. Um, there are some people, they just can't make marriage work. They can't do it. Um, they just can't do it. They're terrible at marriage. And there are reasons for this. Some of it is just flat out selfishness. They're just too selfish. They're too self-interested. They can't share life with a person. They can't do it. Um, and then other people... Um, they get too many secrets that they fear being exposed and they live on thin ice all the time and it's a real problem. Or they're emotionally disturbed. Um, some people are emotionally disturbed and they have jobs, they drive cars, they have kids and blah, 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 but they're emotionally disturbed. Um, I mean, they've got real, real problems. Um, so depending upon all these different things, uh, a, a lot of people can't do it. Um, 
Some people probably need to, you know, run a lease option uh, in the relationship. In other words, don't get married. Lease, you sign a lease with an option to renew in a year. Uh, people that lease the car take better care of it than people that buy it. Um, so I've actually recommended that to some people. You know, why don't you guys create a lease with an option to renew and then in a year or two, see if you, you revisit this and see if you want to keep going. Uh, it's funny how that keeps certain people on their toes. Um, uh, but anyway, um, it's, uh, according to, uh, I forget, I didn't plan on saying this, but according to, uh, what is it? Um, one of those, not eHarmony, um, but they did some statistical analysis here. Uh, dead gummit, I can't remember which it was. Um, but I was on a program with Helen, I forget her last name, Ellen, I, I forget her last name. Um, uh, but, oh, Match.com, she's the science behind Match.com. Um, she's a PhD uh, in relationship stuff. Um, but I, I spent some time with her in New York and we did a show that was aired on the internet. Uh, for Go Tang Yo Tango or Go Tango, this is several years back. I can't remember, but anyway, she said, um, eighty-four percent of unmarried people still want to be married because the the forum we were in and the question that was posed is marriage is it still viable? Um, but according to Match dot com, which has th hundreds of thousands of people, um, uh, eighty-four percent of unmarrieds want to be married. So marriage is still a thing. Um, in America. And so um, anyway, uh, if you're in a relationship and uh, you're having problems, um, you know, there's a reason for it. And typically uh, uh, problems persist in relationships when you are not doing or being what I want you to be. Um, and uh you need to understand right away that you're not going to have much to do with how they turn out on that end. They have to do that. They have to want to do that. Uh, so I want to end with this thought. Um, and I've said this many times before. So for some of you that's li listened to stuff I've talked about, it's going to sound like another song on the same record here. Um, uh, uh, I just forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> Oh my God! What was I going to tell you? Uh, I don't. I don't want to end without telling you now. Um, uh, what the heck was I going to tell you? Um, oh man! Uh, all right, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to stop this recording uh, and then uh, come back with what I was going to tell you. Hold on one second. Okay. <laughs> I remember what it was. Um, all right. So if you're going to get married, um, your happiness has to already be complete. Um, uh, you don't want to marry because you don't want to be alone. You don't want to marry because, uh, quote, you complete me. Uh, you don't want to marry because you make me a better person. Um, you do not want to marry for these reasons. Um, you uh, uh, don't want to marry because I, quote, need you. Um, uh, you, uh, uh, you never want to marry for these reasons. Um, you want to marry because I'm all set and I'd love to share life with you. Um uh, but it's rare that anybody marries like that. <clears throat> what, what people tend to do is, uh, uh, I, you make me happy. Well, that's great. So now I've got this full-time job over here working, you know, nine to five. And then my other full-time job is keeping you happy. Um, that's insanity, folks. Um, that's not how this works. Um, if you don't have your act together, uh, 
before you're married, you cannot expect another human being to put it together for you. That's not their job. Your job is to fix you. It's nobody else's job. Uh, your job is to get happy. No one can do it for you. Uh, nobody should do it for you. And if you think uh, it's your job to complete another human being or to make them happy, you know, you're, 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 it's going to be a problem. Um, so that's not how this works. Um, I'm me. What you see is what you get. This is the way it is. Do you want to join with me and have fun in life? Do you want to be a part of my life as is? This is the car you're going to be driving. It's a jalopy uh, or it's a Mustang or it's a, uh, a moped um, uh, or whatever the case may be. If you're dating a guy and he's has no energy, you're not going to give him any. Um, uh, and if you expect him to be all energetic later, you can forget it. Um, so you, you have to understand that what you see is what you're likely going to get and you're probably going to get more of it. Um, uh, uh, but never, never, never enter a relationship with the idea that it's your job to complete another human being, to make them happy, uh, and to, to do all that. That doesn't work. It never works. Uh, and if you're doing that right now, you need to resign from that role today. Um, uh, and if it all falls apart, you're going to be better off. Um, <laughs> uh, anyway, all right, that's it. So uh, you've been listening to Steve Sisler, and this has been Behavioral Insights.